How's everybody today? I'm fantastic. Thank you for asking. A little sleep deprived, but besides that, I'm doing good. Uh, my name is Steve Norcup. I'm here today to talk about my concept, Three Rivers Mobile Integrated Health. A uh, little bit of background about me. I, I do work as a paramedic. I, I uh, work with a medical device startup here in Pittsburgh, uh, doing uh, research, and uh, um, I'm an MBA candidate over at CAT. So that's kind of a little bit of my background and where I come from. No clicker, so I'll do this from the desk. <laughs> so the problem I'm here to talk about, and this is a little bit unique for a paramedic role, but primary care is, is difficult to access in the United States today. Uh, there's a lot of different metrics that people use to, to kind of judge this, uh, but suffice it to say, regardless of who you ask, due to a variety of reasons, uh, patients have difficulty getting into primary care. Uh, there's logistical concerns. How do you move patients to, to these primary care providers or to the, the locations where they're at? Uh, who's going to pay for this primary care? Uh, the, the, the number of primary care physicians is, is on the decline in comparison to the rest of the medical field. And uh, oftentimes patients don't know how to navigate the healthcare system at large. They don't even know how to get access to these primary care physicians. The, the, what we see is these large swaths of, of, of empty space in the United States where there's no primary care available to, to people. The, the doctors aren't there, the facilities aren't there, the buildings aren't there, uh, and there's, there's nothing. There's, there's no way for these people to get access to the, the health care they need. Is um, it the dark areas on the Yeah, on this, on this particular representation of it, the darker areas are the, are the higher concentrations of a lack of primary care. Uh, you see some real uh, deep pockets of this too, especially when you get into the rural areas, uh, and, and locally if we kind of look into Appalachia, West Virginia is one of the one of the hardest hit areas uh, when you when you look at access to primary care, and when you get down into Virginia as well. What I find fascinating is that uh, there's an organization called Remote Area Medical, and they started by doing medical missions in, in austere places, in rainforests and and third world countries. Their their biggest events now are domestically. So once a year they they do. Uh, a free care clinic, it lasts a weekend, it's down in Virginia, and they, they can't serve all the population that shows up for the free health care. They've now expanded that into Cleveland, Kentucky, and a, a poor state that I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, and, and regularly sell these, well, don't sell, but fill these events to capacity to the point where they're turning people away. I care about this because as, as, as there's less primary care, people tend to turn to emergency services. When there's, when there's not a way for them to access this primary care, they sort of, they, they wait until it gets really bad and then they kind of find care where they can. Uh, and emergency care uh, is some of the easiest to access in the healthcare system, but it's also some of the most expensive that we provide. It's, there's, there's, it's, it's highly trained doctors, it's lots of equipment, they're there 24 seven, uh, and they're, they're becoming overwhelmed. There was, hope that the Affordable Care Act would change that a little bit. Uh, in some places it seems to have helped. In Oregon specifically, it seems to have actually made the problem worse. Uh, once people had insurance, they were more likely to, to access that care from, from the ways they were used to doing it. And that's head down to the emergency room. They just don't have to pay a bill for it or pay cash or, or wind up with a, the fiscal responsibility for it. This is the real staggering statistic that I found when I was researching all this, is, is they estimate that, that seeking this kind of care in emergency departments in the United States is nearly $40 billion that we spend each year. Uh, <laughs> healthcare is 18% of our national GDP, uh, but we don't get a real good value for our money when we spend so much of it providing care in this venue that isn't really appropriate for the care. And we're seeing a lot of changes in how medicine is provided. And I think that's good. Uh, I think that's bad. I think that's a very nuanced conversation. But suffice it to say, we're seeing a lot of new attitudes and opinions on how we can get care to different people. We, we, we certainly spend enough money on it, but we don't get a good return on that investment. Uh, and, and I think that there's, there's a tide shift now, and people are starting to, to realize that. We see telemedicine platforms. These are very popular in stroke care today. Uh, stroke has been a, 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 um, a real driver in the telemedicine platforms. Uh, we see things like innovative vehicle design. Again, I, I, I do stroke, so I see a lot of that, but they're building CTs on ambulances now. 
Uh, that wasn't just taking a big piece of equipment and bolting it to a truck. There was all sorts of uh, requirements that came with that as far as power and stability and how do you move this load around and how do you build the vehicle for it. Uh, <coughs> and we're seeing pre-hospital providers taking on different roles and, and being used as staff in, in different facilities or other places where they wouldn't normally be used. Uh, Virginia, I find this particularly fascinating. They, they take all of their EMS people and they find positions for them in the healthcare system. Uh, it, it can be hard. It, it, it's backbreaking work, and they have a pathway for them to go to uh, once once their time on the trucks is up. And I think cooperation is what's coming next. Uh, a lot of what holds us back from accomplishing a lot of these goals in healthcare, from my perspective, is simply a lack of, of cooperation between key opinion leaders, between stakeholders. And, and again, that's another very nuanced conversation, but I believe as we move forward, more of that cooperation will be taking place. Houston, uh, I've spent a lot of time down in Houston recently. They have this phenomenal project, uh, phenomenal program called Project Ethan. And what they're doing here is they're, they're equipping paramedics with telemedicine technology. When these paramedics get on scene and do an evaluation of a patient, they're giving them options besides just transporting them to the hospital. Uh, when I go to a 911 call here, I have two options. Don't take you somewhere or drive you to the hospital. There's no in-between there. I don't have any mechanism to refer to outside agencies, to refer to another level of care that may be more appropriate, or uh, to, to refer to a specialist or anything like that. These paramedics can sit down with the patient with a tablet, put the patient, uh, put the tablet in front of the patient with a, with a physician on the other side, and work as a physician extender to do an exam on that patient's behalf, or I'm sorry, on the uh, physician's behalf. <coughs> so far, they're getting phenomenal results with it. Uh, some, of the, some of the examples are if, 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 if the physician on the other end decides, so you can provide that person with, with a cab ride, taxi fare to go to a, a primary care office or a clinic or a pharmacy to get drugs refilled. That's oftentimes much more than these people need. Uh, and, and it's a better use of what we have available to us instead of tying up a crew and the resources to the hospital. We see these telemedicine platforms becoming prominent. So doxy.me is one of the, 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 the most prominent ones that we see out there today. Uh, these are all HIPAA compliant. They're, they're set up to do these telemedicine conf, uh, consults. Uh, the, the technology is there and it's in use. It's no longer a technological hurdle to put these options in place. It's, it's just some of that cooperation that I was referring to earlier. Building on the vehicles that they've, that they've developed, uh, again, this is in large part, well, there's a lot of reasons for this, but this is a, this is a mobile clinic vehicle that's deployed down in Texas. Uh, this is, uh, 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 can be moved anywhere, can be moved on a regular basis. It has electricity. I am so embarrassed that I spelled that wrong. Uh, it is climate controlled. There's high speed internet access available to it. If they're going to a location where, where cellular data isn't available, uh, there's satellite options available for, for places like that. You can literally take a clinic or, or a, a, an office and, and move it to wherever that need exists at. And we know, we've known for a long time that better primary care comes with better quality of life. We, we, we don't just have to make money and we don't just have to be heuristic. We can do both of them by spending the money that we spend on more effective treatments. Uh, I'm a big fan of the phrase, the, the right care at the right place at the right time. Uh, that's how we're going to get better outcomes. <laughs> From a business perspective, uh, there's still some market validation work to be done in this process. Uh, this is still very early in the entire iteration process. Uh, we, we have a need for a primary care clinical partner and patient participation. Those two may be one and the same. Uh, but to work with some sort of primary care provider and find out how this solution would work for them. Uh, there, the, there's a need for billing resources, but again, that very well may be rolled into the, the physician and the provider that would be interested in participating. Uh, and you need community paramedics. What we're fortunate with here in Pittsburgh is that we pioneered this concept of community paramedicine. Uh, over at University, in Pitt, uh, University of Pittsburgh and the Center for Emergency Medicine, we were some of the first people to talk about these community paramedicine models, where we can take paramedics like myself and not have them treat acutely ill people, but have them do things like home assessments, medication inventories, uh, care plans, and, and just routine physical exams uh, on people. So 
the resources are there, and these, these, these programs are growing in popularity every day. In regards to a revenue model for this, I, 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 I've come up with three so far. There's a direct care model. There's, there's recruiting patients or, or, or advertising for patients, providing the service to them or, or a, a care facility that, that has a large population of patients, and then billing them in a, in a fee-for-service model. Uh, there's also the idea of being a solution vendor, uh, building the solution, uh, equipping the vehicles, training the providers, and, and selling that solution to an organization that could leverage it. Uh, or finally in a consulting model where you come in and, and help an organization build uh, this system, get the key opinion leaders in one room and talking to each other and, and fostering that, that cooperation. So far, the team consists of myself. Again, I'm a, a paramedic and I do clinical research. And uh, a friend of mine, David Gloss, uh, who happens to be a Point Park student, uh, he's also a paramedic. Uh, he does community health care uh, with, with Operation Safety Net here in Pittsburgh. And they have a long-standing history of taking primary care out to homeless people in the city. Uh, so I'm really fortunate that he expressed some interest in this, although he wasn't able to be here today. <laughs> it's another quote that I came across that, that really struck me. Uh, you know, the U.S. healthcare system is often described as one that fails to achieve optimal health outcomes while generating exorbitant costs for patients, payers, and society. Uh, it's, it's this theme that I keep seeing. We, we spend a lot of money, but we don't get results that we see. My opinion is that we don't spend that money wisely. Uh, the military for a long time has trained soldiers to be force multipliers, to, to take resources that are around them and to, to, to uh, build synergy with those uh, and, and, and uh, use that to accomplish a mission. And I think we can do the same thing here. If we can build cooperation between the people that need to talk to each other and, and facilitate these new models of care, we can make our healthcare dollar go farther. That not only has a fiscal benefit to the healthcare system at large, but it increases the quality of life and the baseline quality of life for the people that we can reach out there and, and get in touch with. Uh, that's what I have. Uh, there was an additional slide, and I don't know where it went. Uh, it was simply just a questions and closing slide. Uh, can I answer any questions for anyone? Yeah, so uh, training paramedics is, is sort of a complicated thing. It, it varies from state to state. There's now a national registry cur curriculum that's, that's uh, assumed to be the kind of standard for minimal education. Um, but, but moving on from there, there are different uh, requirements and certifications. Uh, with the community paramedic model specifically, uh, there's, there's different approaches to how to conduct that training. There is no formally accredited or recognized certification as a community paramedic. Uh, but the nice thing is that physicians can, um, uh, by protocol and, and with training and approval, can, can uh, let paramedics do a whole lot of different things. Uh, and we see this in the hospitals right now. Even somebody that's an EMT that can't perform skills on the street uh, can start IVs, can do blood draws, can read EKG monitors in the hospital, so long as they've had that training and, and been given the seal of approval by a medical director. So it's, the, 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 it's complicated is, is the quick answer. Uh, there's, there's definitely some nuance to it, but they've, they've had real good success taking pre-hospital providers of, of all level, from the most basic to the advanced ones, and, and putting them through this, this community paramedic specific curriculum and, and allowing them to sort of, I wouldn't even say expand their scope of practice, but, but focus it in, in a less acute way, as opposed to emergency setting, uh, uh, you know, hey, how you doing, let's have a conversation sort of approach. In, in my mind, the ideal model for something like this is to establish a network of stops and, and be able to take a vehicle to, to a specific geographic area on a regular basis. So if you can identify a specific town or county where, where you know, there is a profound lack of primary care, if we know that you know, at, the, at the 
Giant Eagle store on First and Main every Wednesday, you know, there's going to be a truck there, and, and you can see the same physician that you saw a month ago, and, and we can do a follow-up visit for you. I think that's where the real benefit is. Um, these really economically depressed areas where it may not make sense to build a brick-and-mortar structure to keep primary care there, but there still is a need for it, and how do we deliver that there? So the model in Houston, how long has it been going on, and did you see any um, information about results? The genesis of that model was really in 2009, and they, they took a nurse, and they put a nurse in the 911 center, and they tried to triage calls to the nurse and get her opinion, do they need an ambulance or not? That lasted, I think it was 18 months or two years, and what they found was when people called 911, they wanted an ambulance to show up. Um, so. They, they, they didn't get real good feedback from that. The next step was to, the similar kind of model, but they had paramedics trying to do this triage. And what they found was the paramedics generally said, take everybody to the hospital. And again, they got the same pushback. Why aren't you sending an ambulance here? Uh, they, the, they, they have seen good results with uh, 2015 is when they started doing the current model of, of, of Ethan. Uh, they get good, good patient satisfaction feedback from a lot of the people because they feel like they have other options. Uh, the, the, the most popular disposition of that whole thing is that the, the, the patients accept the cab fare and took a cab to the emergency room. Uh, another popular one is patients. Uh, yeah. So they, they still want to go to the emergency room, but they, it, and it's like 56% or something like that. I was just looking at it before I came in here. So that's incredibly high. They still want to go to the emergency room, but you know, if they can walk out to the corner and catch a cab and get there in their own time and in a comfortable fashion, they're, they're all for it, you know? Um, I think that's a really fascinating finding, but, but they see good luck with that. And, and what I have read, the feedback that I have read, and I'm actually fortunate so that... ambulance runs, but sort of, half of the ambulance runs. Right. And some paramedic time, but not ER, not ED. You're, you're at least freeing up the leg of the transport from the scene <laughs> to, the, to, the, to the hospital. What, the other feedback I, I have heard is that by the time I, I'm finished talking to a doctor, uh, I could have just taken them to the hospital anyways. And I run into that. I've seen people and they'll argue and try and talk about going to the hospital. You know, by the time you have the conversation and talk to a doctor and have them sign off, we, we could have just taken them to the hospital already and been on our way back to get lunch, you know? <laughs> so um, it, it's an interesting sort of loop. I think what's missing from that model is that you're still taking paramedics that are on a truck that are answering 911 calls. And, you know, let's be honest, people that are doing that are generally a certain kind of individual. They're, they're the younger crowd. They, they want to, you know, lights and sirens and blood and guts and gore. And, and the fact of the matter is they get burned out when they're running low acuity calls and they don't, they don't want to or have the time to spend to, to sit down and do a primary care oriented visit. So when you take these, these, these paramedics and you, or any pre-hospital provider and you specifically say you're, your goal isn't to be back in service in 20 minutes. Your goal isn't to get as many people you know, to the hospital as you can. It's not to get as many transports in as you can. It's to go and sit down and have a conversation and to go and sit down and, and do an assessment that, that isn't just do they need to go to the emergency room or not, that you know, can encompass more of the, the you know, non-clinical measures of health and the, the socioeconomic influences on health that we know about. So I have a question, a basic one. Can you go back? Sure. So which one are you pushing right now? Is it I, I don't. If I go back one more slide, there was one that we still need to do some, some sort of market analysis and, and uh, validate some of these interests. Uh, I, my preference really would be to do the, the, the kind of solution vendor model. Um, one of my, uh, part of my background is working with an air medical group. And one of the popular models with an air medical group is, uh, you know, we'll, we'll give you a helicopter, we'll give you pilots, we'll give you mechanics, you give us a nurse and, and a medic or whoever you want to put in the back, and, and we'll wrap, you know, we'll vinyl wrap it in whatever colors and your hospital logo and everything else. And it, it's beneficial to the healthcare system because they get a shiny helicopter without the, the overhead of starting an aviation program. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it the, the aviation vendor gets that revenue stream from, from operating out there and they get to recomp the cost through billing patients. 
I, to me, that seems like where this works really well. If, if you can build a solution, if you can say, hey, you know, you, you get some primary care guys on board and you tell me where you want that clinic to be and when, and, and we'll make sure it's out there. I, to me, that's, that appeals to me the most. Okay. Yeah. I have a follow-up question. Uh, I'm really interested in this because I'm on the board of a community health clinic okay. uh, in uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And the biggest problem we face is cancel the appointments because patients cannot make it to the primary care center because of transportation and it's very expensive to get there. So this could solve that issue. However, the patients are not expected to pay anything. So where is the revenue flow? Uh, so ACA should have given health insurance to everybody, and CMS is now recognizing telemedicine as a valid delivery model. Uh, there's, there's CMS codes for telemedicine reimbursement. So um, I, I, I don't understand all the nuances of medical billing, and I, I, I need to do some of that validation to ensure that you can, in fact, bill for these. Um, but there, there, without a doubt, is a push to insure everybody. There, without a doubt, is a push to... to um, get people into programs where we can do better preventative medicine. Uh, and and I, 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 assuming that you can bill CMS for it, I think you can show value if you can prove better patient outcomes by getting them involved in this primary care. And, and you know, if it's, if the, it's the insurer, uh, the, the, the organization providing the insurance co-opting or sub, uh, subsidizing that in some fashion, or if it's from just direct billing to patients and, and Picking the right patient population. I mean, payer mix is a thing, right? Anybody that does healthcare understands that that, that comes into it. Uh, I I firmly believe that that landscape is changing, and I, I believe that uh, the people that are providing the money are going to have a better uh, appreciation for for providing that money up front as opposed to waiting to take care of the massive event that happens down the road. I, I don't know if that's a sufficient answer or not, but that's the best I can kind of do right it's now. It's more complicated than that, so uh, can get into nuances later. Fair, fair enough, yeah. That's uh, a good answer. Thank you. That actually leads to my question, which is what you've done here is really create a microcosm of the entire healthcare system mm -hmm. and look to change the model. So, and I think this was your question too, how do you ultimately prove that there is value to this? How do you ultimately prove that the quality of healthcare has been improved I think the cost of delivering healthcare? has gone down because that's what's going to get the healthcare systems I, I, I think the value comes from, from showing better patient outcomes. Uh, in in the, the community paramedicine models that they're doing now, the goal was to reduce readmission rates. Uh, so the way they justified spending the money on a community paramedicine program was to, to lower those readmissions and increase your, your reimbursement rate. And I think that's, I don't have a, a one for one comparison here to make, unfortunately. Uh, despite kind of searching for one, but I, I think that's where ultimately the, the value in the whole thing comes from. I, I find this interesting too. The, the organization that I run provides rural health care in eight offices all throughout Western Pennsylvania. Okay. We must talk about a mobile unit at least once a day, and we always come back around to it would be too much of a distraction for our organization. Somebody has to drive. Now you're comfortable with ambulances, so you've already got a vehicle in the mix. Uh, yeah. But I just feel like it would be a distraction for our organization. It's a really tough decision. I, I think that's where, I think that's sort of one of the missing pieces of the puzzle for, for people like you that you have the medical resources. Yeah. I mean, you can add a couple of FTEs and park them somewhere to go, to go be a, an extender. Um, but working in the field and working in, in those changing environments, that's, that's something that is sort of unique to EMS. People ask what we do real well. It's not, it's not skills. It's, it's making sense of, of chaos and making sense of you know these weird surroundings and situations that we find ourselves in. So I think that's sort of, I think it's a unique opportunity to leverage that. If you want them to be the, the physician extender as well or work on a team with somebody else, that's, that's another discussion you can have. Uh, I'm an EMS guy, I want the old timers to have somewhere to go, so I say do it all with community paramedics, but I, I, you can talk about that. You know, I think that's, that's, there's, there's ways to make that fit for everybody. I, I have one more question about and you just touched on it just now. Um, my understanding, of, uh, and I'm not a, an expert in healthcare, but my understanding is that one of the reasons that primary care, um, the number of physicians is decreasing and that those positions are hard to fill is that it's not a very attractive position and it doesn't pay as well as maybe some specialties. 
So <coughs> do you have any sense for whether this is a viable model to staff? You know, the, to get doctors attracted to it, to get um, an expertise developed um, that maybe is even less attractive than the primary care model that's already in place. So, you know, what makes this attractive to doctors? I, I understand what makes it attractive to a health system. You know, they can get rid of some of those high EV costs. I understand what makes it attractive to a rural population. What makes, it, how do you attract doctors? My understanding of a typical uh, primary care encounter is that they block 15 minutes and seven and a half of that is with a patient, seven and a half of that is documentation. If you start breaking down a physician's time and really segmenting what they do with it, how they spend it, what they, how it's allocated, how it's scheduled, how it's budgeted, uh, they get real granular like that. And, and my thought is, you know, there, there is a, a pending shortage of primary care physicians. The, 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 the people seeking residencies with visas, less and less of that population is, is, is seeking primary care residencies, which, which traditionally uh, has been a, a significant kind of feeder to that. Uh, and further complicating it is they um, federally recently changed the way they fund residency training. And, and I'm not up to all the nuances of this either, but there are, there, it's, it's a bigger cost burden now for a healthcare facility to sponsor a residency uh, position. And they're, they're, they're graduating more graduates out of medical school. So for a larger population of people seeking these residencies, there's, there's a static amount of them. Uh, and as you said, less and less of them are primary care. Uh, I think where this becomes attractive is how do you best squeeze every minute you can out of a primary care physician. If we know we're not getting a whole lot more of them, let's use them more effectively. And if you can get them rapid fire, you know, hey, here's here's a couple of minutes with a patient on a on a on a TV screen. Okay, you 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 document for a minute or two. Click. Here's the next one, all teed up and ready to go. You know, they've they've had a physical exam. You can you can ask about that physical exam. You know what they're. Their, um, their vital signs are because the, the providers on scene have already captured all that. Uh, to me, it's, it's, I think, a radiology. You know, if they, they're, they're, the radiologists get rated on how many images they read per, per minute, per hour, that's, that's where they get their productivity metrics from. And the ones that are trained really well can just blow through those images really quick. And they, they, they're accurate with them as well. I, can we do that with primary care? I, I think it sort of depersonalizes it a little bit. Uh, and, and that's definitely a concern to keep in mind. But if we can make them a third more efficient, that's that many more people that we can kind of get through the pipeline.